thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Word of God, how rich and wonderful it is, and how filled with uh, depth of meaning, and how wonderful it is to be able to uh, share the truth of the Word with uh, this congregation and those who listen by radio and watch by television. May God the Holy Spirit take these things and make them a source of great blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, of course, uh, open your Bible to where we left off, Galatians chapter 5. But we have been, we are actually in the exegesis of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following which has introduced us to the subject of the angelic conflict. And in the angelic conflict, we realize that there are three basic enemies that the believer faces. Uh, one is commonly called the world, and it really is from the Greek word, which looks like this, cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S, -O -S, which is the organized world system in which Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer of uh, Dallas Seminary fame uh, coined the term the cosmos diabolicus, the world system under the control of Satan. It is Satan's world system lost by Adam and Eve there in the garden. And so we studied the world in the exegesis of 1 John chapter 2 and became very familiar with the conflict between the world system or the system of darkness or the cosmos uh, or the cosmic system and God's divine system of power, that is the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit. The second enemy that we are currently studying is called, very often, the flesh. And the flesh is a representation of the old sin nature. And for that, we have gone to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and following. And we have progressed through the fourth verse, and we have noted uh, this conflict which is going on, and this has led us into uh, Galatians chapter 5 for us to study a little further this matter of the conflict which goes on. Eventually we will get to the third of the enemies, which is the devil, and we will continue our exegesis of Ephesians chapter 6 and look at the doctrine of uh, the uh, uh, angelic conflict and Satan. But currently we're studying this matter of the old sin nature, and we have been looking at the doctrine of the old sin nature, and we are currently in Roman numeral 6, and that is the conflict, the conflict of the old sin nature. Um, there are many uh, theologians who say that at the moment we're born again, we receive a new nature. There is no evidence of that. Uh, what we receive is the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, that is not a new nature, really. But you, you don't need to have antics with semantics and argue about it. it is, it's just a, uh, that it isn't true. The only person who had two natures in one human being was God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was truly God and also truly man. Those were the two natures which were existent in him. But we have the old sinful nature with which every member of the human race is born. Uh, uh, and uh, the old sin nature, and uh, beautifully uh, translated in New International, the sinful nature frequently. And the old sin nature may means that this is how we are born. We draw it like this, but that's just uh, a representation cause, because it is called the body of sin in Romans 6.6. 6. At any rate, the conflict that goes on is uh, brought to, uh, to us as we have noted in the previous uh, class, uh, beginning in the fourth chapter of Galatians, in which the illustration is given by analogy. And the analogy is between Abraham's two wives and his two sons. A Sarah, the, uh, the uh, wife of promise or grace, and her son Isaac, and uh, Hagar, uh, who is the son, uh, the, the, the wife, uh, of uh, legalism and her uh, son Ishmael uh, and the conflict which went, went on between the two wives and between the two boys uh, sets up the uh, analogy for what he wants to deal with in Galatians chapter 5. Remember that the chapter divisions are not in the original. 
And therefore, when he finishes his saying uh, that we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman, uh, then he goes on to say uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, it is for the purpose of freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, we are not to be slaves, we are to be free. Uh, then he uh, says, take a stand on the principle. We pointed out the exegesis of this. Take a stand on the principle of grace then, and do not allow yourselves to receive being entangled again by, by the yoke of slavery. And then he says, take careful note of this, verse 2. I, Paul, am giving you some very basic information, and that is, if, maybe you will and maybe you won't, allow yourselves to be circumcised. And then we pointed out that circumcision is actually uh, just what that which was particularly true of the church at Galatia. Uh, the, the Galatian Christians, uh, uh, which included uh, Antioch, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium, uh, uh, these are the three, uh, the four cities of the uh, Asia Minor, and uh, the Galatian church was uh, troubled by the legalizers who came along and added circumcision. But uh, in the book of Hebrews, we have the problem of them going back to temple worship. In the book of Colossians, we have the problem of them returning to uh, uh, special days. And so, to, uh, to give the interpretation of what he's talking about, uh, is is very clear he's talking about circumcision but circumcision the same with the worship and the same with our special days is exemplify our examples of the principle of slavery to the old sin nature and he sets up then the principle that you are either going to be a slave to your old sin nature or you're going to be a free person and enjoying the freedom of the filling or the control of God the Holy Spirit one or the other. You can't be have one foot in each side. You can't be half one and half the other. Now, the book of Galatians is divided really into two. The first is salvation by grace. And under salvation by means of grace, uh, the slavery was exemplified by adding something to a simple faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, some people have added baptism. Uh, other people have added uh, joining the church or church membership of some sort. Some have added raising your hand. Others have added walking an aisle. Uh, others have uh, added praying through uh, uh, to this matter of uh, uh, salvation by grace through faith. Others have added feeling sorry for your sins. Uh, uh, others have added change your way of living. And uh, others have added... Uh, lordship salvation. If Christ isn't Lord of your life, He is not uh, 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 your Savior. And uh, all of these things. But all of these were principles of human works added to salvation. And while there are some fundamentalists, of which we are a part, who strongly would object to some of these things, they still add some things to uh, the uh, matter of salvation by grace through faith. And they obscure the truth of the matter that it is by grace and uh, grace alone through faith and faith alone. And that is the matter of salvation. But the great problem with the church at Galatia was not that they had a confusion as to how to be saved. It was what do you do after salvation? And herein is where multiplied thousands of fundamentalists have gone off the deep end and have made a mistake. If we are saved by grace, we advance by grace. We pointed out in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, that he says, How can you be so stupid, uh, so ignorant of the fact that those who are, were you, uh, were you saved by grace or through, by, by works? Well, how are you going to be made spiritual by works if you're saved by grace? And then uh, the uh, continuation of these things. And therefore, the point is that we are made spiritual by the same grace that uh, is necessary for salvation and which provides a perfect salvation uh, grace. And the same thing is true of uh, advancing spiritually and having the victory over the culprit in our lives, and that is the old sin nature. And so you cannot uh, function under uh, human works. And under uh, grace, uh, the grace principle, salvation is uh, faith plus nothing, you see. And under uh, spirituality, 
It is the power of God plus nothing. And uh, so many believers are trying to live the Christian way of life by means of energy of the flesh or power of the flesh. And, and what's, what's very confusing to uh, a lot of people is uh, that they do not even realize that that's the way it is. And we uh, illustrated it by the fact that some people think that God is pleased by the fact that they have a Christian Sabbath. Well, Christian Sabbath, there is no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. So because they don't, they see, don't see it, they change it to call it the Lord's Day. And uh, the Lord's Day is a special kind of a day. There's no place in Scripture where that is, has any merit at all. And people are using this in order to say, look, God, how spiritual I am. I don't play ball on Sunday. I don't do that. I don't work. I don't cut my grass on Sunday. And therefore, you should bless me. That's ridiculous. That's works. That is not grace. Grace is going to be grace for salvation and afterwards, or it's not going to be enough for salvation. That's what he points out here. You are either saved by grace or by works. And if you're saved by works, you're not saved. You're spiritual by grace or by works, and if you're spiritual by works, you're not spiritual. You may appear to be spiritual because what you are like on the outside is absolutely not the issue. It's what is on the inside that counts. And there were some people who, the Colossians, had special days. But we have a, a whole group of people in the fundamental church who say you're spiritual, spiritual by what you wear or don't wear. Or spiritual by whether, you know, wear, wear clothes. Uh, uh, girl, ladies can't wear slacks. And uh, I've seen them go so far as to say that, well, a lady can wear kulas but not slacks. Why? On what basis do they have? You know what they do? They go back to the Old Testament principle where it says a man, shall, a woman shall not dress in men's clothes. That's Old Testament law. Besides that, if it goes back to the, to, the, uh, to the Bible, then they should all be wearing robes. And the difference was in the kind of robe that they wear. Or wearing makeup. Or women put their hair in a bun on the back of their head. It, uh, buns, the only place buns are good is on a plate. <laughs> That's absolutely stupid. But but spirituality by what we wear, or spirituality by certain language that we use. Uh, we have a certain spiritual language that makes us, uh, 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 sets us apart. Or spirituality by uh, uh, the, the big five. I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls that do. That kind of a thing. Ridiculous that this is supposed to commend us to God. We are free, beloved. Free not to do anything that uh, we want to do because we will be limited by the power of the Holy Spirit. But free to be all that God wants us to be, all that God provides for us to be in His fantastic grace. For it is God who is uh, working in you to will and to perform of His perfect will. And... Uh, uh, what the mistake that many people make is that they impose, many fundamentalists impose certain legal restrictions, legalism on believers. And we all start as babes in Christ and we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by remaining in fellowship and taking in doctrine on a daily basis. And you have a person who is uh, already here to spiritual adulthood in one of the three stages of spiritual adulthood who has learned uh, the ten problem-solving devices of the Christian way of life, who sees a babe down here and starts to impose certain Christian way of life that, that he is practicing upon this uh, person down here. Where they don't realize that you have to learn how to crawl before you walk and you walk before you run and you run before you can ride a bike and all those kind of things and you ride a bike before you ride a car and all of this is a part of spiritual growth and God will take care of those things so give this person the freedom to live his life as unto the Lord and God doesn't need your help or mine in correcting anybody else the omnipotent Holy Spirit is able to handle every believer so let that person live his life as unto the Lord you live your life as unto the Lord and take advantage of the fantastic grace of God but here's what happens to so many people they're born again by means of grace and they love the Lord and we realize that. But then they go to starting to become spiritual with the rolled R. That's the way to make That's doubly spiritual if you roll your R. Uh, spiritual. And by, uh, for spirituality, there are certain kinds of works that they feel will commend them to God. 
and which is going to make God look down from heaven and say, Oh, what a wonderful Christian you are. I am going to bless you because you are such a great Christian. Now, if you ever get that idea in your head for 30 seconds or one second, realize that at that moment of time, you are a legalist. Because God has never, nor will he ever, bless anybody on the basis of the fact that they have earned it or deserved it. It is grace from day one to the end of your life. And if you ever get any blessing in your life, it is because of who and what God is. Not because of who and what you are. And if you get fat-headed and think that God is blessing you because you are little Mr. Gur, Mrs. Goody Two-Shoes, you are sadly mistaken. And you are, quote, fallen from grace. Ah, but that's not what it says. <laughs> we need to correct that. And that's where we are at this point of time. In Galatians chapter 5, we are looking at verse 4. By placing themselves under one point of the law, which was, uh, in this case, uh, in the uh, app interpretation, uh, under the, uh, the uh, circumcision, they were placing themselves under obligation uh, by the law. So, we have uh, uh, progressed through verse 4. You, well, let's go back. Uh, uh, of no effect... We corrected the, uh, the, uh, the, the order of the, from the Greek. Of no effect or uh, 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 useless or uh, 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 neutralized from the ultimate source of Christ, who, whosoever is being justified by means of the law. The word justified is a beautiful word and has a great deal of meaning. It looks like this in the Greek. D-I-K-A, I -A -I left out the I, I-O-O. -O. This is the uh, Omicron, this is the Omega, so we have to write them differently. Dekai O-O. -O. Dekai O-O -O means to be declared righteous. I've heard people say uh, justification is justified, never sinned. Isn't that pathetic? Because it's nothing like that at all justified never sins. Justified means you are declared as righteous as God is. Not as righteous as if you'd never sinned, but as righteous as God is. And that's a whole lot more righteous than if you'd never sinned. These simplistic concepts that people come up with uh, disgust me. Declared just as if I'd never sinned. Nuts. Declared as righteous as God is. For what happens is, in the doctrine of imputation, God takes the absolute righteousness which belonged to Jesus Christ and he charges it, imputes it, to the account of the believing sinner whose best righteousness is, me is relative righteousness. And therefore, it's the righteousness which belongs to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 That righteousness is, de is charged to the account of this believer. Now, how does he get it? Not by works. No, no. By means of grace through faith. By means of grace through faith. They are, they are declared righteous in the sight of God. This is the present passive uh, indicative form of dikaio. And this is, this is important uh, because uh, this is a perfective present tense for a past event with the present reality. And it refers back to the fact that salvation came, or de being declared righteous, came in the past by means of grace through faith, and it is, re is a present reality because of the same thing. It is an eternal thing that God has done for us. Passive voice, the subject receives the action of the verb. Who is the subject? You or believers. The believer receives being declared righteous on the basis of grace and grace alone. It's not for something he works for. If this were the active voice, the subject produces the action of the verb. And the, the subject would then be, be uh, performing the declaring of righteous. It would be declaring yourself righteous, but you can't do that. 
Nothing you can do, you receive it. The voice of grace, passive voice, tells you that it was done for you by means of God. And the indicative mood is declarative for the reality of the fact that you received being declared righteous at the point of salvation and it is a, per, a present reality in your life. Uh, but a person who, who has this as a permanent possession and now is seeking to live his life by means of the energy of the flesh, by means of uh, uh, what he is doing or not doing, is said to here, uh, here in this passage, to be fallen from grace. Now, this word needs some uh, uh, explanation. First of all, we need to go back and find out what it means, uh, what it was, how it was used in the original uh, Greek. The word uh, looks like this in the Greek. E-K-P-I-P-T-O, ekpipto. Now, ekpipto was a nautical term. It was used by the sailors, particularly, uh, in the uh, days of the Greek language for a ship which was sailing along and then, for some reason or other, uh, it drifted off course, and the word means to drift off course. It was also used to, uh, for, to lose one's hold on something. And the concept is not that one loses one's salvation, but a person who drifts off of course from grace. For if you stay on course to grace, uh, grace is going to keep you uh, realizing that it is not who and what I am, but who and what God is that counts. I am totally dependent on who and what God is. I have nothing in myself. Of course, the songwriter said about salvation, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. The same thing is true for the, the spiritual life. It isn't uh, what I do, it's what God is doing in me. But here's a person who is who was saved by grace, and now who is seeking to be uh, to live his life by means of, of human works. He's drifting off course from grace. He's not lost his salvation. He cannot lose his salvation. And while he loses his uh, hold on grace, grace will never lose its hold on him. Because we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, not by our own works. But see, these Jewish celebrities, these legalists, had come around, and they had uh, talked about the Apostle Paul, and Paul looked pale in comparison with these great super-apostles as they came in with their eloquence and their flowing robes, and the Apostle Paul didn't have that. And they said, <laughs> you mean to tell me that that uh, half-blind... Uh, short, fat, high squeaky voiced, eyebrows that met, hook nose, b uh, knock kneed uh, character called Paul came along here and told you that you could be saved by grace and you didn't need to keep the law? Well, how foolish! And then they proceeded to teach them that it was necessary for them to be, uh, the, to, for them to be uh, spiritual by means of, by something that they would do. And so they laid upon them all of these uh, requirements. And really what had happened is they had turned from the, their, the Apostle Paul, who was their true teacher, and with that Bible doctrine and grace, they had become involved in reverse process reversionism in which they reversed the process, became enamored with inconsequential persons, these false teachers. Yesterday I was uh, tooling across the dial and I ran across one of them, called Jan's attention to it. There he stood with his beautiful robes, his silver hair, and his eloquence and this magnificent, they showed this magnificent crystal, uh, I don't want to tell you who it was, but this magnificent place filled with people, just, just every seat just crowded out, and this organ, which sounded like uh, uh, thunder, uh, was going, and it was just magnificent. 
And uh, uh, here was a person who uh, doesn't believe in sin. Here's a person who doesn't believe in salvation by grace through faith. And all these people were following him. And I said, isn't it amazing what people will do? But you see, when you turn from the truth, you turn to inconsequential persons. And you turn from the truth to error. And most error is half-truth. He uses the Bible and quotes from the Bible and has all kinds of statements. It's like most New Age people. He quote, they love to pick out things from the Bible. The Bible's inspired in parts, and we're inspired to pick out the parts, you see. And then to turn from grace to law or to legalism. And to turn from the omnipotence of God to human power. All of these things, this is drifting off, of course, from grace. But it usually follows uh, turning from the real teacher uh, to some inconsequential person. A uh, dear old doctor, so-and-so. Uh, he is such a sweet... Oh, his, he's not, his, he doesn't have much to say in his messages, but he's such a wonderful man. Who cares? It's what he teaches that counts. And uh, they moved and in, in, they inverted the object and from grace they turned to legalism. And so Paul says, you ha are drifted off course from grace. This is an aorist, active, indicative. The aorist tense, uh, only in the indicative mood, has a time frame to it. And the time frame here refers to the point of time that they went positive toward the false teachers and the false doctrine. Uh, they drifted off course from grace. They lost their hold on the magnificent principle by which God has uh, determined people should be saved and people should live their lives. And the active voice, the subject produces the action of the verb. The subject here is ye, that is, the Galatian believers, and all believers who are uh, in this situation. Uh, uh, the you believers who, uh, at the point of time in your life, you went positive toward this false doctrine, you drifted off from grace. Grace, charis, in the Greek, C-H-A-R-I-S, is the most magnificent word that has come down the pike. I, I used to teach boys and girls that grace is God's middle name. And uh, when they were real little, and I met, read across an adult one time, stopped me in the mall, said, I remember you, you're Bill Paul. I said, yes. Said, you know, I was at such and such a place such a time, and you taught me something I've never forgotten, that God's middle name is grace. And uh, I said, well, if you remember that, I hope it's true in your life, because that is the truth. Um, we were at uh, uh, Bonnie's uh, mother's funeral, and I, I just talked about grace. And on the way home, uh, uh, I went to the funeral. Uh, my wife uh, turned over and there were tears in her eyes. She said, I'd never get enough of hearing about grace. Never enough. I always want to hear it. Bonnie was blessed by grace at the time of the greatest loss when she loses her lover, uh, her mother, I mean. Okay, well, uh, going to. Uh, what, a, what a tremendous. Uh, message, the message of grace. It's grace, it's grace, it's grace all the way, which eliminates all of that who and what we are. It's all who and what God is. And you know something? There's not one moment in your life that you ever dare to drift off course from grace. You don't, you can't do it because you need it to live with your husband or wife. You need it to live with your children. You need it to work on a job. You need it to, to be oriented to the, or where you live in, in society, in this nation. You need it to, in every area of your life, you need to operate under the grace of God. And therefore, beloved, you need to, uh, to understand that there is not a moment in your life when you ever dare to, to drift off course from grace. Therefore, we are introduced to another doctrine, the doctrine of freedom. This is a, uh, a doctrine which is related to this, this passage. And we'll begin, point one, pardon me, with a definition and an explanation. What do we mean when we talk about freedom? For Freedom, for the purpose of freedom, Christ has set us free. 
Stand firm on this principle, therefore, and do not become again t entangled or ensnared with the yoke of slavery. All right? It's such an important principle. Uh, freedom, first of all, uh, sub-point A under the definition. Freedom is the status of human volition, free will. And that principle has a relationship both to establishment as well as the spiritual life. This is called temporal freedom. Temporal freedom is the heritage of physical birth that God has decreed for the entire human race. And it begins when the person is born. And therefore, any time, any time there is slavery, we realize that is wrong. Because God established freedom for the individual from the moment of time of his physical birth. Human freedom is the, is the environment uh, for which, in which, uh, 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 the individual makes his choices and then assumes responsibility for his choices and suffers the consequences of his choices. Now, when a child is born into a family, obviously that freedom has to be restricted because there is no capacity. And the object of the parents is to provide an environment in which the child gets increasing freedom with a, s a corresponding responsibility. We studied that under the doctrine uh, we, which we just finished in the matter of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And the principle that the child grows, and as the child is given certain freedoms, uh, he assumes the responsibilities. If the child fails to assume the responsibility, he loses the freedom. That's why we have some people who are teenagers who are not free. They, because along the way they did not assume responsibility for the freedom that they have, and therefore they lost the freedom. And so here they are now teenagers when they ought to be free to be making their own decisions, but the parents can't trust them to make their own decisions because they have abused the principle of freedom. And then there are situations in which governments restrict freedom. Now, uh, this is a part of the angelic conflict. And governments will restrict freedom uh, from time to time. This is not in accordance with the plan of God, but, but God has uh, not determined to overrule the course of, uh, of human history. Uh, he allows certain uh, choices, and g people get the kind of government that they want. Remember that. Oh, uh, you say that's not true. Oh, you see, today in the Soviet Union, we're seeing an ex a, a fantastic example of this. Now, we cannot determine specifically uh, Mr. Gorbachev's uh, uh, motives because we do not understand them, but this is what apparently is the case. He made a, a lot of moves toward human freedom. At the, uh, in last year, I mean, some things happened in the Soviet Union that you and I thought would never happen suddenly they're happening, including the printing of Bibles and the distribution of Bibles, the, the opportunity to uh, worship, and the opportunity for people to leave the Soviet Union. And while some people have consistently suspected he has other motives, uh, uh, that's uh, neither here nor there for this uh, illustration. Now, the hardliners are saying that this is not good for the country. And they're giving Mr. Gorbachev a hard time. And he is therefore uh, backpedaling. He is stepping backwards because he's now trying to appease these. Whereas for a time he was trying to appease Yeltsin and his crowd. 
by giving uh, freedom and autonomy around this, the, uh, the uh, republics, quote unquote. And now uh, he is facing uh, increasing economic hardship. People uh, go and wait for hours in line for bread, uh, for meat if they can possibly get it, for milk if, if it's available. And so you know what some people are saying? What we need is exactly what was in that, in that. Um, uh, if you remember uh, when Mary, uh, what's her name, Mary Chestnut said you know, that uh, your people can't exist like they need a strong leader, is what she said. Remember that at the very beginning, she said we need a strong leader, and that's what they're saying to many people in the Soviet Union. Saying, we need a strong leader. We need a dictatorship again. We need someone who can. To say that, be, why? Because we don't have enough bread, we don't have enough milk, we don't have enough coffee, and we can't get enough cigarettes. Oh, whoa, it's me. How can they live? Of course, without that. We don't have those things. So we need a strong central government. And it goes back. And if the people are saying that, and the people are demanding that, and the, the, the commentators are saying, well, most of the people won't stand for that again. Well, you'll be surprised what people will stand for. People will stand for... Uh, for fantastic slavery. You take some people in some of the countries of this world in which they, politically they might have a measure of freedom, but they place themselves under a strong religious leadership, a strong religious uh, world, uh, uh, church that is uh, uh, worldwide, and that church keeps them under their thumb. And enslaves them. Can you imagine a religion in which people trample each other to get into a particular service at the beginning of uh, the quote-unquote Lenten season, and they, they're uh, they, so anxious to get in to uh, quote-unquote uh, show God how religious they are that they trample over some people who fall to the ground, and that happened in, in the world in this last week. Well, how many were killed? Uh, as people were trying to get into an Ash Wednesday service, uh, ridiculous, under the the principle of of uh, uh, slavery, and you travel down to Mexico and you will see people in poverty, and some of those cathedrals have gold plated domes. Where did they get it? They built the money out of the people and held them a ransom for their quote unquote salvation. Don't they have the freedom? Yes, they have freedom, but they, are, they make their volitional choices to reject the freedom that's available. We have a number of missionaries in Mexico who tell us it's very, very, very hard to get the message out. People just aren't ready to listen. But the point is, uh, volition is the choice. And while someone may say, well, uh, uh, the Chinese don't have, uh, didn't have any choice when the communists came in, oh, yes, they did. They had tremendous choices. The missionaries who were in China welcomed with open arms the communist Chinese because the communist Chinese were wiping out the opium den dens, and they didn't like the opium dens either. And they thought, well, here, they're doing a good thing for this country. But how stupid they were, you see. How ridiculous, how idiotic. The same thing was true when Castro came to power in Cuba. I heard missionaries come back and say, the door has never been open as wide. How stupid for the missionaries to say, come in, we want you. you know, they don't understand what they don't understand the issue. Why? They were interested in changing the moral climate rather than the spiritual condition of people. Well, anyway, the point is that under establishment or temporal freedom, uh, people get the kind of government that they deserve. But Regardless of whether this is true, God has decreed that anyone in the human race who goes on the point of positive volition can achieve spiritual freedom. But, and it is a matter of their own free will and volition. Because a person who is under, let's say they're under a government in which there is oppression and they are uh, under a government of slavery. But you see, they still have free will and volition as far as the, uh, the spiritual life is concerned. And God, in His matchless grace and His absolute righteousness and justice, 
truth will make available to every member of the human race, according to Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 18 and following, information about his godhood and his omnipotence. And verse 32 also indicates that, uh, uh, that there is something about his retribution or his judgment that is known uh, by all mankind. This is called God consciousness. Every member of the human race comes to the point of God consciousness. Now, this, now they can function here. They, they, they understand that there's a supreme being, that he is omnipotent, and they may only get it from looking at the sky or looking at something else, but they come to this point. Now, they're not saved. Because no one is saved apart from believing on the revealed person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but this is where they first function under their free will and volition. Now, if a person chooses to go on negative volition at the point of God consciousness, Paul uh, tells us in Romans chapter 1 that they give themselves, God gives them over to the slavery, and there are three, three types of slavery which are listed uh, in that passage, and we're not looking at that, but they become slaves. They, and they choose the slavery for themselves. However, if they go positive at the point of God consciousness, then God assumes the responsibility to give to these people gospel information. They must be told that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And God, in his righteousness and justice, will move heaven and earth to get that information to people who are all over the world. And this idea, I've heard missionaries come and say, uh, not here, but they've said other places, that if you don't tell them, they'll die in their sins, and God will hold you accountable. That is blasphemy against the righteousness and justice of God, beloved. God could not be fair and send someone to hell who, would, who came to the point of positive volition and God consciousness. He can't do that. He must give them the gospel. And just because you and I don't know about how the gospel gets to people. I heard of a, a deep-sea diver who was a, a blasphemous character and, and uh, blasphemed God. And one day he was in a ship at the bottom, uh, work walking through, and he came across a trunk, and he opened the trunk, and here was a Bible laying there, and it was open, and underlined was John 3.16. And he said, God, if you'll follow me to the depths of the ocean, I can't get away from you. I believe. God is faithful and just. He is not ever going to be unfaithful. And here comes gospel information. And once again, they can function on negative volition. They can say, I don't care to believe this. I'd rather work for my salvation. In which case, they become slaves to themselves, and they remain slaves of their old sin nature. But if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are set free from the law of sin and death. They are set free from condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that fantastic? And here they are under a government that has made them slaves, but they are free in their souls. And we have uh, looked at some of the, uh, from some of our uh, missionary contacts in the past, we have looked at uh, some of the activity in the Soviet Union in the past in which uh, George Veens and others have uh, been able to uh, minister the Word of God to people who are uh, under a fantastic of uh, slavery, of government oppression, and uh, KGB listening in, and uh, danger of being sent into uh, prisons, and yet God has uh, provided for them. And anybody who is positive toward God, uh, God, uh, God conscious will receive gospel information. And uh, anybody who, after they're born again, wants their positive toward Bible doctrine, God says, you should know the truth. The son, the, the son said, you should know the truth, and that's the doctrine, and the truth will set you free. You are further set free by Bible doctrine, and God will provide uh, somebody to teach everybody who goes positive at the point of uh, uh, the hearing of Bible doctrine so that there can be fantastic spiritual growth. And whether it's by means of the printed page or by tapes or video, however it is, God will provide this for, uh, uh, for a person. But freedom then uh, has the two areas, the temporal freedom and the spiritual freedom, and this is where everything uh, begins. Uh, uh, B, uh, freedom is exemption from arbitrary control. It's 
somebody told me I ought to write nicer for the TV audience so they can read what I write. You're used to it. You, you recognize my scribbling, but they don't. So And write bigger because we don't get in close enough on some of those things. And uh, related to uh, freedom from arbitrary uh, control. Uh, now, uh, this means that under temporal freedom, uh, the laws of divine establishment are necessary. The laws of divine establishment uh, have four uh, uh, effective uh, uh, areas. One is in uh, uh, human freedom, that is, the ability to make decisions for yourself. The second is when you use that freedom to choose someone of the opposite sex to marry. And when uh, in the marriage you determine to have a family. And the fourth is, uh, has to do with your uh, the uh, geographic location, your the nationalism which in which God has d uh, separated the nations by means of uh, uh, four different areas according to Genesis chapter 10, which again is not our subject, but uh, uh, God uh, provides freedom under the laws of divine establishment in the spirit in the. Uh, the principle of temporal freedom. In, this, in the area of spiritual freedom, it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Please note that little phrase, in Christ Jesus. This refers us back to the principle of positional truth. We have just completed the study of positional truth, retroactive positional truth, and current positional truth. But simply to say, positional truth means that at the point of salvation, under the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit places every believer into union with Jesus Christ, so that at that moment of time, in union with Christ, the believer shares all that Jesus Christ is and all that Jesus Christ has. You are in Jesus Christ. And that is the key to your spiritual freedom. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the only place it's located. It's in Christ. And the reason you are in Christ is that you are identified with Jesus Christ in his death on the cross and his burial. You are also, in the current positional truth, identified with his resurrection. And just as Jesus Christ died for all sins... He also died unto us in nature, Romans 6.10, and therefore you as a believer identified with Christ may have freedom from the old sin nature because of his finished work on the cross. And because of his resurrection from the dead, you are identified with his resurrection and you are identified with new life. How was the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead? We read in, in Romans chapter 6 verse 4, by the glory of the Father. And we talked about the, uh, the isagogics of the word and the etymology of the word glory, and it refers to the power of God. And the power of God that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is omnipotence. And the power that of omnipotence is that which causes the believer to live the new life, to walk in newness of life, as he says in Romans 6, 4. And this is the law of spirit of the spirit of life, new life, in Christ Jesus. And this is the law that sets us free from the law of sin and death. And so under, under the, the principle here, the laws of divine establishment are for everybody, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is just for those who are in Jesus Christ. But, beloved, it's for all those who are in Jesus Christ. Not for a few elite people. Not for a few special people. Not for a few super uh, uh, Christians. It's for all believers. Therefore, it cannot be earned or deserved. It has to be a grace function. It has to be made available uh, by, by no merit that any human being can have. And, therefore, God must make it available to all of us, and He does. This new uh, power is available to all of us so that now God calls upon us and demands from us that we live a superhuman kind of life. And most believers are trying to live this superhuman kind of life by means of the energy of the flesh, by human power. 
But he tells us that he has provided a supernatural power by means of grace so that w this supernatural power makes it possible for us to live the superhuman way of life. And in every situation of life, you're going to face daily a number of decisions. The decision as to, in living this life, are you going to utilize supernatural power or are you going to utilize human power? Too many believers try human power, and when it fails, then they try supernatural power. And that's the dumb way to go. In other words, why push the car when you could be driving uh, from the source of the engine that's under the hood? And so God says, my supernatural power is available by means of grace, unearned and undeserved, for you. And when you're using supernatural power, you are really free, free to enjoy the life that I have provided for you. But over here, you're always a slave, and you'll never, ever enjoy for a long period of time the Christian way of life. Well, we'll continue in our next class right at this point. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this wonderful, thrilling, glorious message which you have given to us. Spirituality by means of grace. Spirituality by means of your power. That we may become all that you want us to be. Not by gritting our teeth, not by doing the best we can, not by committing ourselves, not by becoming a disciple of somebody else, but from the source of the volition of our soul, de determining that we will believe and avail ourselves of the power that you have given to us in the omnipotence that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that we may become all that you would have us to become in the hostile environment of the devil's world, free indeed, free indeed. That's what we are. Free in Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Father. May God the Holy Spirit help us to appreciate these things and to go on our way singing and rejoicing in the freedom of being in Christ by grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.